जे अनिलो प्रेमा धरम काचो
Krishna will determine that. But I depend fully upon uh, my guru, Srila Prabhupada, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, and Lord Sri Krishna. Uh, I'm very happy to be coming here again to USP. I think the first time I spoke here was in 1981. So, about 18, 17 or 18 years ago. And uh, I've spoken here a number of times. I think I've probably spoken in this hall. Are there other halls like this? Well, then this is the hall. So I've spoken in this hall, I think, most of the time. Uh, there's a video which was made, in fact, in this hall called The King of Knowledge, in which I posed a question to the students who were assembled here. Uh, what is the difference between the live body and the dead body? And different opinions were given, which we reported. And then I also spoke on the subject. Today's subject will be a little different. It is advertised that I will discuss about miracles. Uh, every religion, every founded religion in the world, generally is founded on the principle of some one or some many sorts of miracles. For example, uh, in Christianity, the basis of Christian belief rests on the miracle of Jesus being resurrected. Jesus rose after three days uh, and rose uh, with his body into the sky and returned into heaven. That's the basis of uh, the Christology which surrounds the personality of Jesus. In uh, Krishna's religion, not, I'll just say, a one branch of Hinduism, in Krishna consciousness, we believe that Lord Krishna came from another world into this world and performed many miracles. And in fact, every religion records many, many miracles. I recall about Two years ago, there was a, a public um, a, a great public uh, event, you could say, about the deity of Ganesh drinking milk. So, do you, was that happening here in Fiji also? At least all over the world, Hindus were claiming Ganesh is drinking milk. You can feed Ganesh milk. What is a miracle? A miracle means an event which defies the laws of nature. The laws of nature are said to be laws, and laws are not supposed to be broken. Laws are supposed to govern, not be defied. For example, if you go onto the roof of this building, it's expected that you will fall down, by jumping off, you will fall down to the ground. It is not expected that when you jump off this building, you will go upwards. Because that would defy the law of gravity. Uh, similarly, uh, it's not expected that when someone dies, their body and they will be resurrected into the sky, into the heavens. That defies the laws of nature. Normally when a person dies, that's it. At least their body, that's it for their body. Their soul made the mind, but not their body. Uh, Krishna is famous, for example, for his dancing with many gopis. And it's said that besides each gopi, Krishna manifested a separate body. 
Now, I'm sure everyone, or at least some of the men sitting here tonight, young men rather than old men, the young men at least, would like very much to be able to do what Krishna is supposed to have done. Go to a dance hall with many young girls and manifest a separate form with each girl. So, but no one has been able to do that. So if someone does do it, we call it a miracle. Now the question is, do such miracles really exist? Do they take place? This is the question. Of course, uh, when the Ganesh miracle took place, many persons had their explanation. I'll read you. This is another book which I published uh, about a year ago called Reason and Belief. The Indian government Anyway, let me read you what some of the headlines at that time said. From the pioneer in India, it said, milk-drinking deities unleash mass hysteria. <laughs> the National Herald headline was, Reaching God the Milky Way. <laughs> <laughs> The free press said, a miracle for believers and a mystery for atheists. The statesman said, scientists dismiss it as mass hysteria. The Asian age said, holy smoke. Psychiatrists believe this is only hysteria. The Telegraph said, Awestruck devotees see the second coming of the Avatar. And the Asian Age had a second article which said, The gods, pre the gods prefer milk, but they're saying no to coke. <laughs> now, uh, the Indian government, when this so-called miracle took place, the Indian government gave the following statement through the Associated Press. The Associated Press, rather, gave this statement. This, the Indian government scientists offered milk mixed with colored pigments to an idol in a New Delhi temple. Although it disappeared from the spoon, it soon caught at the idol. The scientists credited the miracle to surface tension, saying molecules of milk were pulled from the spoon by the texture of the statues. The federal minister for welfare, Sitaram Kesari, accused two right-wing groups of starting the rumors to capitalize on Hindu nationalism and win next year's general elections. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the government's position there. The question is, did Ganesh drink milk or was it simply some scientific explanation? Well, without miracles, there would be no religion, in one sense, in one sense. What is the meaning of religion? Does it depend on miracle or miracles? The word for religion amongst the Hindus is dharma. The word karma comes from the root dharma, which means that which sustains that which is basic or intrinsic to something. For example, sugar has a basic quality of sweetness which cannot be separated from sugar. Water has a quality of liquidity. And if water becomes solid, we call it ice. It's frozen water. It's not simply water any longer. 
Fire has the basic qualities of heat and light, which cannot be separated from fire. You cannot remove heat and still say that this is fire. Or you cannot say, for example, that this chili has no heat. So when we speak about dharma, we're trying to understand what is the basic quality which may, is fundamental to religion or to the individual who practices a religion. Taking away that quality removes the nature of the religious person. What quality is that? Well, the sages of India have claimed that the most fundamental quality of the individual is the attitude of serving. You will see in every living being this tendency for serving something or someone. Surely we see this in a shopkeeper who serves the customer, but we see it also in a wife and the relationship between a wife and a husband. The husband and wife serve each other. Children and parents, they also enter into relations of service, exchange. Yet each one of these relationships does not endure. The time a person lives is limited. And when the time runs out, so does the service. So we cannot agree that religion can be called or equated with service. However, there is one word which added to service makes it possible to equate it with religion, and that is sanatana. Sanatana, just like we say, sanatana dharma. Sanatana means eternal, without any end. Sanatana dharma means that type of service which is never ending. That is called religion. When you can find out that quality within each of us which cannot be discontinued, you have hold of religion. Just like a Christian may convert to being a Hindu. So to say that Christianity is eternal religion, if it's eternal religion, how can you convert from it? If you say that Hindu can convert to being a Christian, then that also indicates that it may not be eternal. So Sanatana Dharma runs deeper than these so-called religions, which are actually a type of faith that have a beginning and they might have an end. But eternal religion has no beginning and no end. Now, what is the difference between Sanatana Dharma and miracles? Do miracles fit within Sanatana Dharma? Can miracles take place? Well, first of all, we said that a miracle is a reversal of nature's law. Now, when we speak about nature's law, it implies a lawmaker. You cannot have a law without a lawmaker. So, laws sometimes can be changed, but not just anyone can change a law. Usually, it takes an act of some high judicial body or a supreme head of state to violate a law. In the United States, for example, in India, I have also seen what is called state of emergency, where the government suspends all the laws and takes complete power in its own hands. Now, if we accept, and this is a big acceptance, but if we accept that nature is, un, is somebody's nature, 
Like if I say your nature or my nature, if we say nature's, whose nature is nature, it may be God's nature. And if God is the cause, or if we accept God as the, just like we have the word in Sanskrit, Ishvara, or even Param Ishvara. Ishvara means controller, Lord. And Param Ishvara means supreme controller. Now that supreme controller, whose nature are the laws which control the universe, that supreme controller may from time to time intervene in the laws of nature and reverse them. If so, then it's possible for Jesus to be resurrected or for Krishna to duplicate himself so many thousands of times to dance in Ras Lila. If we accept that nothing is impossible for Parnam Ishvara, for you and I, we are limited. We are under nature's laws, but we are not God. We are, at best, as, as Professor Sharma said, part and parcel of God. Uh, in the Gita, it is said, Mamai Vamsha Jiva Lope Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. The Jiva is an ans, is a part. Nityo Nityana, Chaitanas Chaitanana, Ekol Bhavanam Yoga Dadaki Kamun. This verse states, We are Nitya, we are eternal, and God is Nitya. The difference is, we are maintained by God. There's an interesting example which says that what is the difference between the individual Atma or soul and God or the Supreme Soul? The difference is not one of quality but one of quantity. And the example is given of gold in a gold ring and the gold in the gold mine. The quality is the same. The quantity is vastly different. So what is possible for God is not necessarily possible for the individual. It may be that God can transcend nature's laws. In fact, this is one of the characteristics or within the definition of God, that he is not bound by the laws of nature. He's unlimited. We are limited. He is all-knowing. We are ignorant. He is all-pervading. We are localized. We are not God. At best, we are part and parcel of God. But we are not the complete God. When the complete God acts, then he may transcend the laws of nature, and we may have what we consider to be a miracle. However, we must distinguish between genuine miracles and, if you want to say, man-made miracles. Now, let us take, for example, a 747 airplane in flight. In a sense, you could almost say it's a miracle. I think if a 747 plane landed a hundred years ago in Fiji, everyone would have said it's a miracle. If the 747 had landed in India a hundred years ago, or anywhere in the world a hundred or two hundred years ago, it would have been considered a miracle. Now that is an interesting point. What is common today is yesterday's miracle. 
That means that our definition of miracle is to some extent relative. It's relative to how we understand nature. Now we understand that what a 747 is and how it works. Let's take the example of an atom bomb. Or why an atom bomb? Let's take a more peaceful example of microsurgery. The kinds of surgery that can be done today were unimaginable previously. And anyone who had the power to perform such surgery would have been considered a miracle worker. So what, what is a miracle? What determines what we call to be a miracle? It depends very much on how we define nature. If we say that nature is uh, everything and there is nothing beyond nature, then the tendency will not be to believe in miracles. On the other hand, if we accept that there is some transcendent power which governs nature, then we may accept that certain things are beyond nature's uh, control. Now, I would not say that a 747 is a miracle any longer. But if I was living 200 years ago, I would have said, of course. Similarly, in Vedas we hear that Brahmaji has four heads and rides on a swan. Now, which is more miraculous, to ride on a swan or to ride on a 747? I mean, both. And today, I think we would think it's more extraordinary if someone was seen with four heads riding on a swan than if 350 people landed on a 747. But a thousand, two thousand years ago, or maybe we want to go back a little further than that, say 4,000 years ago, or maybe even 5,000 years ago, a person like Narada, Narada Rishi, could play a, you know, an instrument like a tambura, or similar to a tambura, and he could fly. Without a swan, this, you know, what is the name of the Indonesian Airlines? Garuda. Garuda Airlines. Who is Garuda? He is the eagle carrier of Vishnu. Now, either, well, all right, it's just, they could probably say it's just mythology, but a national airline is named after supposedly a bird that can carry Vishnu. And I'll tell you something else about these Garudas. It is said that they can fly from one planet to another. And when they lay eggs, they lay eggs in the middle of flight. And the egg falls, and the velocity of the falling egg, the velocity breaks the egg open, and the baby garudas hatch. And some of these garudas are so big that as a meal they eat elephants. I see people are just saying, well, that is definitely mythology. <laughs> well, what about a 747? It's a mythology to us today, but a 747 is not. There are some really extraordinary things going on in the field of science which were unimaginable some time ago. Similarly, there are things from our religious past in all the religious histories which today are unimaginable because we cannot do them any longer. For example, there is a history called Mahabharata. Mahabharata means the greater history. Bharata, Varsa, India, was formerly called 
Bharat and Varsha. Varsas, there are different Varsas which make up Bhumandala. Now, universe is considered to be constructed slightly differently according to the Vedas than what we hear from science. And Bharat Varsa is that place in which Bharat, the uh, son of Rishabdev, the eldest son of Rishabdev, was entrusted as a king. And so the planet, if you want to call it, or Varsha, was called after him Bharat Varsha. Now in the history of Mahabharata, the greater history of this planet, we read about a war that took place at Kurukshetra. And in that war, they were throwing weapons with the use of mantra, which is sound vibration, where they were firing weapons by sound vibration. For example, they would fire a fire weapon, and a massive fire would descend. And then the opposing side would fire off a water weapon in order to put out the fire and counteract it. Then the opposing side would throw a weapon which was cold and would freeze the water. And one by one each side was doing... Now, if we hear this today, we just say mythology. You know in that Mahabharata war, how many persons are said to have been killed? 640 million persons. Now the population of the world today is about 5 billion humans. That means 10% of today's population. It's unthinkable. And therefore we say mythology. The question is, and I think we have to consider this point, that persons in the past lived by a different, uh, a different conception. The world was charmed. It was religious. Every act had religious significance. Today, we live in a secular world in which religion is separated from most activities. For example, business has nothing to do today with religion. Politics is not supposed to have anything to do with religion, at least in some countries. Of course, in India, you know, politics has a lot to do with religion, right? I mean, people, just like we see some actors who play the part of Ram, then they run for political office, and everybody thinks Ram is running for office. <laughs> I must vote for this person. India is still very religious. Although the government does its best sometimes to discourage that, but the people are so fundamentally religious in India. When they play Ramayana on the television in India on Sunday mornings, the whole practically India stopped. They stood still. 70% of the country were watching Ramayana. People were doing puja to the television set. <laughs> <laughs> it's so religious. But today, you go to Bombay, go to Delhi. It's a very, these are very secular cities. They're, they have become practically, in many ways, as secular as New York or Los Angeles, and in some ways, maybe even worse. This is the demythologizing, you can call it. That's what one theologian, Christian theologian, called it, the demythologizing of the world. Taking, demystifying the world. And today, in liberal Christianity and liberal religions in general, there is a demystification, demythologizing, taking the mystery out of religion and making it basically an ethical concern. 
But it's very hard to establish ethics on your own without some belief system in some in the miraculous. And so the world is not becoming more religious, more ethical, it's becoming less ethical and less religious. The question is, can we do without miracles? Can we take out the miraculous from religion and still have religion? Think about any religion, you take your choice, and think of all the things in it, just like, for example, you go to a Hindu temple and you pray, right? to the Murti. Now that Murti is made from what? Metal, stone, wood, maybe a painting. How can a metal, stone, wood, or painting, what is the value of the same prayers in front of you? Why are you offering incense to a brass net, brass Murti? If you don't believe in miracles, there's no use. If you don't believe that somehow there's something more there than simply a brass statue, why this mantra, you see? Hare Krishna. What is the value of chanting this mantra? Where is Krishna? If you don't believe that God, Krishna, and his name are the same, then why bother chanting? If I, if Professor Sharma goes home tonight and I go to where I'm staying, and I call, oh Professor Sharma, oh Professor Sharma, Professor Sharma will be snoring in bed. <laughs> he won't hear me call. Unless I ring the phone and call him by and wake him up. On the other hand, we believe that when we say, Oh Krishna, Oh Rama, Oh Hare, He hears. Now, Professor Sharma and I are within this world. We cannot defy the laws of nature, but we believe that Krishna can. Something is special about that name, or about that person who has that name that makes us believe that by saying his name, although he may be very, 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 very far away, he's practically within us. He's so close. Every religious person, every religion, basically believes in prayer. Prayer to God. Intercessionary prayer. That means, for example, if you have someone who's sick, or dying, don't, I think most of us may say a prayer on behalf of that person. And we believe that that distant God can hear our prayer. Now, that is defying the laws of nature. Why do we believe such a thing? Because sometimes when we pray like that, God maybe always hears our prayer, but sometimes God answers our prayers. You ring someone on a phone, if I ring Professor Sharma, and he doesn't answer the phone, still I may think, let me ring tomorrow. Again, the phone doesn't get answered. Then I still think, well, I'll ring him another time. But after a while, I'll begin to think, either Professor Sharma is no longer living there, I have the wrong number, something, I'll think, something about this. Similarly, if you keep praying to God, just like we prayed last night for Ring, we were doing a program, which place? College of Advanced Education. And I lectured on the point about what makes Ring come. Why is it that there's no rain? Why is there a drought in Fiji? I quoted from Bhagavad Gita, in which the Gita states that human beings subsist, live, 
on food grains, and grains are produced from rain, and rain is born from yajna, sacrifice, and yajna is born out of one's prescribed duties, dharma. So I said that it is everyone's duty, ultimately, to, to worship God. And when God is sufficiently worshipped, especially by this sacrifice of singing his holy names, then there will be rain. And it rained it did. It rained like anything today. Now, of course, someone will say, well, it wasn't due to your prayers. There were a lot of Christians that were praying also. But I believe we were all praying to the same God. Of course, someone else will say, what's due to any of your prayers? Rain has nothing to do with prayer because there's no God anyway. Rain comes when it comes by some na nature's arrangement. In any case, it did rain, and we were praying. So we think the rain came because we were praying. And we think it will keep raining for a while because we're still praying. <laughs> so I, again, bring the point about miracles. Can you have a religion without miracles? What would religion be like without miracles? Again, what are some things we do in a religion? Uh, let's take another most basic fact of every religion is generally the belief in a soul, an atma. Where's the soul? When I asked this question in 1981 in this hall, what is the difference between a dead body and a live body? We finally came to the point, the difference is that one has the soul inside and the other doesn't. That when the soul leaves the body, that's what is called death, clinically, a person is dead. And as long as the soul is in the body, the person is still alive. So life is not based on the body, but it's based on the soul. Now, why is it that scientists cannot make from chemicals a living body? To this day, science has not yet been able to manufacture even a simple thing like a blade of grass. They may be able to synthesize amino acids, but that's as far as they go. They can't produce a single blade of grass. How many blades of grass are growing in the world? How many trees are growing? How many humans and chickens and dogs? more than we want are growing <laughs> without any scientific endeavor. Now how? How do we explain that? Why is it so difficult for science to synthesize life? Because, the Vedas would say, because there is one element that they cannot synthesize, they cannot capture, and that is the soul. Human life, or any type of life, is not simply due to chemical combination. There must also be a further element added, which is the soul, which we have no control over. So here is a miracle, a fundamental, miraculous belief in the soul is basic to every religion in the world. If you wish to take out miracles from religion, you have to remove the concept of soul. Now, if you remove the concept of Atman, you can't have, at least you're finished with Hinduism, you're finished with Christianity, you're finished with every major theistic religion. The only religion you'll have left is Buddhism, which ultimately does not believe in the soul. Anatma. Buddhists say no soul, there's nothing, nothing is. Right, near Vishesh, nothing. Every other religion in the world will have to be given up if you remove the element of soul, unless you significantly all 
alter the religious teachings. So, I started with the question, do miracles exist? And I answer you that miracles are simply a way of explain, of saying that I can't understand something at present. That is really it. Because what we consider miracles today, for example, riding on a swan, were not miracles to the people of thousands of years ago. When Jesus was able to turn water you know, into blood, or blood into wine, rather. Uh, when, you know, Christians have their miracles, Hindus and Muslims have their miracles, these things were practically almost ordinary in those days. Today they're extraordinary. But today's miracle was extraordinary then. That's my point. And I would say that without the miraculous, the type of religion you have would be so severely altered that it would be unrecognizable. Now I'm going to stop here and we will have some time for discussion. Based on what I have said, let us see if it has invoked any questions or <coughs> statements which anyone would like to offer. Question? Anyone? Up in the back there. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, is it stated in the Venice that the war will come to an end one day? And if yes, could you briefly elaborate with me, please? Yes. The question is, is it stated in the Vedas that the world will come to an end? The Vedic conception of time is cyclical, not linear. Linear time means like the year 2000 is coming up. But cyclical time means time goes in cycles, which the Vedas call yugas. So at the present time we're in Kali Yuga, which will last for another 427,000 years. After which time the Sakya Yuga will begin again. Now altogether the four Yugas make one Divya Yuga. And it takes, how much time? Uh, four million, is it four million? 320,000 years? Anyway, millions, a few million years makes up a Divya Yuga. 100 Divya Yugas make up one day of Brahma. And 100, 1,000, sorry, 1,000 Divya Yugas make up one day of Brahma, an equal number make up one night, and there are 30 days in a month, and 12 months in a year, and Brahma lives for 100 years. So the duration of the universe is 311 trillion, 40 billion years, of which more or less half of it is elapsed already. So we still have another 150 trillion years before the end of the universe. <laughs> when the universe ends, you see this person here floating, his name is called Maha Vishnu. His eyes are closed because he is in a mystic sleep called Yoga Nidra. And in that mystic sleep, he is dreaming. And we are a part of that dream right now. Every one of those bubbles are a universe. And he has breathed them out. And when he breathes in, everything goes into his body. So each breath of this Maha Vishnu takes 311 trillion, 40 billion years of our time. So you can go in and out of Maha Vishnu. 
Now, we have been born and we have died, according to the Vedas, many times in that period. Again and again, reincarnation is taking place. The goal is to get out of the dream of Mahavishnu, to stop being part of his dream and get re into real life. The real life is beyond Mahavishnu, beyond the material creation in what is called Vaikuntha, Vaikuntha Dham, that eternal abode or place where God is residing in his original form. So our goal is to break out of the cycle of reincarnation and to go back to our original home in the kingdom of God, where we get a spiritual body and we can have eternal relationship with God. At least there's other explanations also. Yes, I want to gamble and make some money, find someone who says that and bet against him. <laughs> in other words, no, I don't believe it, that, that there's nothing stated in the Vedas like this. You'll still be around in 2001. I'm going to go to Cambridge and I, I will get my degree in 2001, so I at least want the human race to remain that long. <laughs> so there's something which I don't understand. If the soul was really a part of Krishna, what did it have to make with Lisa? I mean, what does the soul of Krishna gain through coming to the world? Just like, why does, why do we do things sometimes even though we know they're wrong to do them? It seems that each individual has some unlimited curiosity, which causes you know, them to do things against their better judgment. So each person is created with free will. We each have some small degree of independent free will, which we may either use or misuse. So some souls misuse that independent free will, then they come within this material creation. But uh, don't you think it would have been wise of this not to invite us to the first time that you didn't understand? He did, but we didn't listen. <laughs> I mean, we're advising you right now to start chanting Hare Krishna, but how many of you will listen? <laughs> Another question? I wish that you could get a copy of this book, and you should order a copy, because there's uh, one chapter in here which is called The Problem of Evil. And the question you're raising, which I will repeat to everyone's benefit, is that when Hitler killed six million Jews, men, women, and children, where was God's mercy? Why didn't he intervene? Uh, the problem of evil is a very serious problem for most religions to explain. If God is all good, why does he allow causeless, senseless evil? Uh, this question I remember discussing in our university course, and the professor uh, stated, based on the statement of Max Weber, who was a famous sociologist, that the explanation of the Hindus is the only explanation which begins to satisfy this question. Max Weber did say that, and so did my professor. The Hindu explanation is karma. Man proposes, God disposes. God does not interfere with the minute degree of independence. That means, and this is, this is what the Hindu answer would be, that six million people whoever they may be, you call them, they call themselves Jews in that birth, somehow had a collective destiny which ended up with them being killed. The soul doesn't die. 
So, first of all, nobody's soul ever gets killed, but the body does die. If you ask that question, I'll give you a much more basic question. You say that that six million deaths was so evil, why didn't God give his mercy? I say to you that every death is evil. There's no such thing as a good death. Otherwise, everybody would be lining up to die. <laughs> Instead, we see everyone trying to avoid death. If God is all good, why does he put us through all of this death and disease and old age? Well, first of all, the soul and the body are different. The mind and the soul are also different. The mind is not the soul, the body is not the soul. As long as we identify with our body, as long as we identify with our mind, we have to suffer. But when someone becomes self-realized, realizes themselves to be the soul, not the body, not the mind, then they can get free from this cycle of birth and death, birth and death, birth and death. Why does a parent punish a child in order to teach the child? Now you may say, well, but at least the child learns something by the punishment. What do we possibly learn by dying when we cannot remember we had a past life? I cannot remember my past life, but I can read the Vedas. I can read a book like Bhagavad Gita and at least understand theoretically that I had a past life. I may not remember the details, but theoretically I can understand my soul is being reborn again and again. I can learn, in other words, by that lesson of the Gita. And maybe you cannot remember your past life, but you don't learn everything simply by memory. You cannot remember that you were in your mother's womb. But you were there. Your mother will tell you you were there. Other people will tell you you were there, but you don't know it by memory. Many things we understand not by memory by the use of our intellect. Now, what is the difference between a dead body and a living body? Because clinically, the moment of death, there's very little difference between the one moment and the, and the moment of life. But yet something is totally different. That something is the, what we call the Atman, the soul. And it is that soul which is our real self but which is now lying in a sleeping condition, practically, dormant condition, so much so that we don't know about the soul, we only know where the body is. I think that I am Kamal Krishna Goswami. Professor Sharma thinks he's Professor Sharma. Each of us thinks that we are this body, this mind. We don't know who we are. We don't know the self within. We're not self-realized. When you become self-realized, then there's no question of birth and death. You escape out of that cycle of reincarnation. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to avoid your question, but I'm trying to explain, I gave you the answer to begin with, that the Vedic answer is karma. Everyone gets the reaction to their past karma or actions. And then, just like why do 300 people die in the airline? Now, we would say that 300 people who had a similar type of karmic reaction coming ended up in that airplane at that moment. That's the answer we give. I don't think that, I don't blame God for my suffering. I blame my own ignorance for my suffering. The cause of suffering is ignorance. God is trying his best, but we are ignoring him. Another question? Again, back in 1981, we had a long discussion about uh, 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 that Baba. <laughs> in fact, we made another video called God's Competitor. 
I thought it was a very apt title, God's Competitor. I mean, obviously God doesn't have a competitor. But uh, sometimes people call themselves or let other people call them God. So then we have to say God's Competitor. Um, I would urge, you know, anyone who calls or claims that they're God or any followers who say that their guru is God to please come immediately to Fiji and put an end to the drought. I would urge them to find a cure for AIDS. I would urge them to do a lot of things, which somehow or other he doesn't seem to do. Now, if you say that the Buddhi the coming from the photograph is very valuable, well, it may produce a certain amount of faith in the follower, but practically speaking, it's not bringing rain to Fiji. So, I'm not going to question whether it's a miracle, I'm going to question what is the value of the miracle. As far as he goes, I have seen videos, and there has been news releases where people expose some of the things he does. There's a lot of, you know, contention around his so-called miracles. Uh, but really, I, I, again, I have to say, I think that even if someone can do miracles, does it mean that they're God? Moses is said to have walked through part of the Red Sea, right? When the Jews were leaving Egypt, the Red Sea divided, and apparently Moses walked right through, but Moses never said, I'm God. Why should a yogi or a guru allow his followers to call him Bhagavan? When Srila Prabhupada, our founder, was asked about another guru, he was actually a guru who used to come to Fiji. He was a boy guru. Remember that boy guru? I'm trying to avoid saying his name, but <laughs> Bal Yogi. Remember the Bal Yogi guru? The young boy, chubby boy. Anyway, he was the, he was his followers were calling him also God. So when Prabhupada was in Malaysia. The news reporters asked him what his impression about this new, the latest God from India. And Robert said, I think that he is not God, he's a dog. <laughs> Very strong words. In fact, Robert said, I kick him on his head with my sh boots. But Robert didn't wear boots. But his point was that people who call themselves God, you know, are the opposite of God. And when you spell God backwards, that's why Prabhupada said what he said. Srila Prabhupada never called himself God. He didn't even call himself the servant of God. He said, I'm the servant of 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 God. That is what a genuine devotee says about himself. So, what are the value of such miracles, even if they are going on? I have my doubt about them to begin with, but even if they are true, so what? Does it mean that by performing these miracles, uh, uh, people are getting free from old age and death and will not take birth again? It seems to me the first business of a guru is to teach his disciple to love God. But Unfortunately, this particular person has placed himself in the position of God. That, I find that very unfortunate. Theory of evolution. Well, the Catholic Church has accepted evolution now. And uh, they say that God creates through evolution. Uh, Srila Prabhupada did not accept evolution. Sorry to tell you that, but he debunked it. Uh, his problem with it was that according to the Vedic teachings, the most intelligent 
creatures are at the beginning and not at the end. In other words, uh, according to Vedic teaching, the first being is the most intelligent. That is Brahma. Brahma, the creator, is the first being in the universe. And he creates mental uh, offspring through the power of his mind. And gradually the various different species are created. Uh, which is very, very different than the other way around, where we start with the most simple cell creatures gradually evolving into human life. There are a lot of problems, of course, with evolution. There are many missing links still. Uh, it is still, although it is widely accepted today, or taught today, there are many problems with Darwinian evolutionary theory uh, from a scientific point of view. But still, uh, it has some strong points to it. But uh, Srila Prabhupada basically was quite conservative and fundamental in his holding to the scriptural beliefs. The Catholic Church, I use that as an example, which is quite conservative, has accepted evolution. It says, God creates through evolution. In other words, evolution doesn't necessarily mean, to accept evolution doesn't mean that you have to be an atheist. So I'm giving that example. The Catholic Church accepts evolution as an official policy of the Church, but obviously they believe in God. They say God uses evolution to create. That's his way of creation. Uh, the Vedic literature does give some explanations about creation, uh, but it's quite different than Darwinian evolution. So I'm just telling you, ask me what we, what do I think about evolution? I'm telling you what Prophet said and what the Catholic Church says. My guru thinks, and uh, I, I think that I will think some more about it <laughs> when I get finished with all of the education. I have a little free time, and I want to look very carefully and see what to think exactly. But at this point, I will say that I think just as. Uh, my guru taught, and uh, I, I, I think that I will look more deeply into his teachings and uh, just see how it can be explained. Uh, I'm not a biochemist, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a scientist, and I can't respond in a purely scientific way to uh, Darwin's theory, but I think that there's need to do so. If someone is going to base their beliefs on the Vedas, they're going to have to give a very, very strong answer to any scientific explanation. Our guru, Prabhupada, created a branch of his kind called the Bhaktivedanta Institute, which are scientists. It's an institute of scientists, specifically to respond in a scientific way to Darwin, especially to Darwin. Prabhupada's wrote a uh, book called Life Comes From Life. And his basic point was, uh, he was concerned with what is the origin of life. And he felt that it was more than simply chemicals. And uh, there are, there, there's an interesting book written by one of our scientists, which bases it on information theory that mathematically it is impossible for the degree of complexity within even simple creatures to come into being just mathematically from chance. And Darwin's theory is based to a great extent on chance. It, it play, chance plays a very important part in that theory. Random chance and then, you know, various different uh, selection, natural selection takes place because of chance occurrences. But the laws of mathematics, the laws of chance, practically preclude the possibility of all the different selections that would have to take place to evolve complex life. And therefore, Prabhupada 
rejected Darwin on this basis, but mathematically, the number of, uh, uh, of chance selections, it's, it's impossible for that many to take place to evolve complex life. And that's why Kafka rejected in the amount of time that the universe has existed, it wouldn't be mathematically possible. At least one of our mathematicians developed an argument along those lines. His name is Richard Thompson. Another question is idolatry. Yes, um, there is a spiritual reason. When you finish, are you you're studying here? Are you a student here? Yeah, professor? <laughs> School of Medicine. School of Medicine. Oh, you School of Medicine. Okay. So, we hope that you will graduate. But if you don't graduate, you will repeat again the courses. Now, the problem is that too many students are repeating and not graduating. In other words, the problem of the human population is it's supposed to graduate. The graduation from the human form of life is to go back to be with God. But if you don't, then you have to repeat as a human being and take birth again. And other human beings are coming from the animal species. From an animal, they take birth, the soul goes from animal life, and the next higher life is human life. So there are so many souls coming up from the lower species into human life. And there are so many humans who are not graduating to the kingdom of God that are again being born as humans, and so the human population is increasing. Is that a good explanation? At least it's a good logical explanation. Any last question? Okay, let's. That's not very good. I want the last six, seven rows up there. We are all sitting. Please let me hear. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. Now I didn't tell you why we chant. This chanting is your uh, final exam to graduate. <laughs> When your last moment of death, the moment of death comes, your last breath comes, that's the final exam, and this is the key, right? This is the password to get out and not have to take birth again. Now, if you try to only do the chanting at that time, it won't happen. Just like for any exam, you have to study. So every day we advise people to practice chanting Hare Krishna so that when that moment of death comes, when is it going to come? You know what year you're going to die? We don't know. Therefore you have to always be ready. So every day we do some chanting. That's why we have these little bags that we carry with us with our chanting beads inside. And on every beat we practice. But sometimes we also chant together in a group, which is more powerful. So I would request you that when we all come on stage and do our chanting, make it very loud. Let us make this room vibrate with the Maha Mantra of Hare Krishna. So I will request our uh, chanters to come back on the stage for a final chanting session. And let's hear it. Oh, don't, don't leave now. This is the wrong time. A few of you have walked out. Chant loudly. <laughs> <laughs> Spiritual knowledge that will increase your ability to help you find the 
Enjoy the Raj Bhagavan. <laughs> 